The October 7 terrorist attack by Hamas and the subsequent bombing of Gaza by Israel have triggered a fraught debate here in America. For two communities, Muslim Americans and Jewish Americans, this has been a deeply painful experience and one rife with conflicting emotions. Tonight, we're going to take some time to talk to people from both communities. Both have expressed feeling abandoned and under threat with a rise in Islamophobic and anti-Semitic attacks. On Wednesday, the Council on Islamic Relations announced that it has received 774 complaints and reported incidents of bias from across the U.S. since the Hamas attack. The advocacy group estimated that this is the largest number of complaints received in a similar period since former President Donald Trump called for a Muslim ban. At the same time, the Anti-Defamation League reported an equally significant spike in anti-Semitic incidents. According to preliminary data from the ADL Center on Extremism, there have been more than 300 anti-Semitic incidents since the Hamas attacks. That's a roughly 400 percent increase from the same period last year. In these very raw moments, communication is key, and how you convey your message matters. To that point, we've seen egregious incidents of certain individuals waving deeply anti-Semitic signs, suggesting the world needs to be clean of Jewish people. Others tearing down posters of Israeli hostages. And some George Washington University students projecting glory to our martyrs messages onto the school's library. And while that is not indicative of the message from most of those who are calling for a ceasefire, these incidents are deeply painful and triggering for Jewish Americans. Rabbi Sharon Brous, a progressive leader of the Ikar congregation in Los Angeles, who is known for her public criticism of the Israeli government, summed up the views of many in a recent sermon. She said that there is an existential loneliness happening within the community and that our human ask is that people give a damn when we die. She ended her sermon calling on all of us to step closer when another people is suffering. Rabbi Sharon Brous joins me now. She is the author of the upcoming book, The Amen Effect, which is a hopeful guide on how we break down this sense of abandonment by finding common ground and sharing in our collective grief. What a perfect book at just the right time. Rabbi Brous, thank you so much for being here. And I want you to just say more, um, more about how you and um, many in your community are feeling since October 7th. Thank you, Joy. I'm really grateful that you're having this conversation in this way. Um, it's been a really difficult time. It's the anguish, it's the sorrow, it's the shock and the fear and the uncertainty, and it's also the loneliness, as you said. Um, there is this profound sense of absolute shock that not only were these atrocities committed against civilians, there were, as we now know well, 1,400 um, Israeli civilians who were murdered and more than 200 who were taken captive. I think the number now is 222 who are still in captivity. But really, the response around the world has been quite shocking. And I've been thinking over the last couple of weeks, if one could imagine a scenario in the world in which 1,400 civilians are raped and murdered and abducted, and hundreds of thousands of people around the world take to the street to celebrate. And it's just unthinkable. I mean, what we in the, at first imagined might be some kind of moral conflict or silence uh, from some, now we're seeing is a full celebration or condoning of these kinds of atrocities. And it's been incredibly painful. Um, there's a false binary, I think, that's been established now that either you have to, to stand for Palestinian liberation and for justice for Palestinians, which I, personally have stood for and fought for for decades, and many in the Jewish community have, um, now means that you ostensibly support Hamas's terror. And that's just atrocious and unthinkable. There is no way that this conflict ends without us finding a way to live together, finding a liberation that is a shared liberation, building together a just society. And that means shared grieving. That means honoring the humanity in one another. And it's it's not happening there. And it's really not happening here on college campuses, on the street, and really across the world, sadly. Yeah, I mean, you, you've said so much there um, to to, pack, to dig into, but I, l let's talk about some of, as you said, the the reaction um, so quickly after October seventh absolutely shifted to people focusing on 
Israel's reaction and the reaction to and what happened in Gaza and the deaths in Gaza. Um, you are um, somebody who believes in intersectionality. You've talked about intersectionality in your career. And as you said, you have been a supporter of Black Lives Matter and also a supporter um, of Palestine, of, of Palestinians, um, you know, search for their own sort of liberation and having a, a homeland. Um, do you think that part of the issue is that people are conflating the government in Israel, um, somehow conflating that with Jewish people worldwide? Because obviously, you're an example. Not every Jewish person in the world agrees with that government. Do you think that people are just not expanding their vocabulary to get beyond that government? Yeah, I mean, there's an absurdity to suggesting that the peace-loving, mostly left-leaning, mostly secular Jews living in Israel's southern communities are fair targets for people who are opposing Israeli government policies. The equivalent of that would be an attack on a preschool or an old age home in Westwood, California, under the Trump administration, right. where most of the people who live in Los Angeles, you know, a blue, blue state, blue city, um, are going to be held responsible for the actions of the government. There's an absurdity to it. And what's so yeah. painful about it is that it's not just Hamas that made that calculation, but it's literally professors at the greatest universities in this uh, in this country that have made that calculation. People who are responding with joy, exuberance, celebration at the murder of innocent people. And it's just, it's just beyond devastating for us. And it's certainly not the way to have a peaceful and just future for anyone. And it's also joy. It happens to be the way that, that, that anti-Semitism works. Anti-Semitism is a form yeah. of racism that operates in a, a little bit differently from the way that other racisms work. Um, one of the principles of anti-Semitism is blame the entire population for the actions of one party. Um, and we've mm -hmm. seen that throughout history. But the other thing about anti-Semitism that I think is important is that built into the Jewish psyche is the knowledge and awareness that Jews can often survive and even thrive in societies. And then in an instant, something happens, everything changes. And we are, you know, victims of persecution, pogrom, and even genocide. And so that's built into the Jewish psyche. And that's why so many Jews in this time really just feel so incredibly vulnerable, because that's precisely what happened here. Some of the atrocities that we saw committed um, in, on October 7th really are Nazi-like atrocities. And I use that language very, very carefully. But I met with many of the survivors when I was I was in Israel last week, and I was able to talk to a number of people from one of the hardest hit communities called Kfar Aza, right on the border. Mm -hmm. And what they described about the way that families were being hunted in their homes and, and, and children hiding in closets while their parents were murdered and then their other siblings taken and abducted into Gaza. These things really, they're not only horrific for what they are, but they also trigger a very profound trauma in the Jewish psyche. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, absolutely. And and I think that, that is sort of left out, as you said, of the conversation, because there is such a dichotomy between what a government does and what a people do. I think you gave a perfect answer to that. I'm going to give you, um, we have a little bit more time. Give us some positive language that people can use who care about the loss of those 1,400 um, precious lives and also care about the loss of life that's happening um, right now in Gaza. What's some good language that we can use that's affirming and that will bring us together? Well, our hearts are capacious enough to hold both. If we really yeah. care about humanity, then we care not only about the Jewish babies that were massacred in these towns on the South, but I am also deeply concerned about the Palestinian children in Gaza who have nothing to do with this war and who deserve to live to live a free life, a life of dignity and a life of peace. What I actually am asking of us is that we dare to hold the humanity and the heartache and the trauma and the need for security security and safety of the Jewish people, while also holding the humanity and the heartache and the dignity and the need for justice for the Palestinian people. This is not, these are not binaries. These are things that we can actually and must actually seek out and achieve together. <coughs> and I'm having a, <coughs> a coughing fit <coughs> at the worst time. Rabbi Sharon Browse, thank you so much. God bless. I really appreciate you being here.